News anchors lined up outside the courthouse, numerous cameras inside the courtroom live streaming every minute, photographers on ladders hoping to snap a photo of the parties as they exit the back of the courthouse, lines around the block for the 100 coveted wristbands to watch the proceedings from inside, fans rushing to the back entrance screaming as they catch a glimpse of the plaintiff driving off in his Escalade, millions of people watching countless live streams around the clock, soundbite analysis from every legal expert under the sun. To say the Depp v. Heard defamation case is a media a frenzy is frankly an understatement at this point. Today, instead of gossiping about two people who we do not know and the relationship we were not a part of and is none of our business, y'all are nosy. We're going to use the Depp v. Heard trial as an opportunity to discuss the role that media coverage plays in our judicial system and how that's changed in recent history. People are live tweeting. People are live streaming. What does it all mean? Where does it end? Let me pause and thank the sponsor of today's video, Warby Parker. I think the thing that I get most compliments on are my glasses, which are Blair frames from Warby Parker and I love them. I've been getting all of my glasses from Warby Parker for years. Warby Parker is committed to providing exceptional vision care online and in stores, offering eyeglasses, sunglasses, eye exams, and contact lenses. Glasses start at $95, including prescription lenses. And you can try Warby Parker's free home try-on program. You can order five pairs of glasses to try on at home for free for five days. There is no obligation to buy. The try-on glasses ship free and they include a prepaid return shipping label. You can try five pairs of glasses at home for free by going to warbyparker.com slash Lija. So I'm in the process of deciding between three different pairs. First, we have the Reyna in Elderflower Crystal. Ooh, what do you think? Next, we've got Durand in Rosewater. Mmm. And finally, we have Elina in Truffle Tortoise. This one makes me look like I read books. You know what I mean? I kind of like that. Which one do you like best? I'm still not decided, but additionally, for every pair of glasses sold, Warby Parker distributes a pair of glasses to someone in need. Almost 1 billion people worldwide lack access to glasses. This means that 15% of the global population cannot effectively learn or work, which is wild because glasses were invented 700 years ago. Warby Parker partners with nonprofits like Vision Spring to ensure that for every pair of glasses sold, a pair is distributed to someone in need. Go to warbyparker.com com slash Lija to order your home try-on kit for free today. So I'm not gonna get into the nitty gritty details of the Depp v. Heard lawsuit because frankly, literally every other YouTube lawyer has already done that for you. And frankly, as a survivor of relationship abuse, I've found this case and everyone's a fascination with it to be a bit triggering and gross. The, the basics are as follows. Amber Heard and Johnny Depp were married. Then Amber Heard filed for a divorce and a restraining order against Johnny Depp. She then wrote an op-ed for the Washington Post about relationship abuse and people understood it to be referring to Depp. So Depp sues her for defamation. Then Depp's lawyer says her entire story is a hoax. So Heard countersues Depp for defamation as well for his lawyer's remarks because the lawyer was supposedly acting as an agent of Johnny Depp. The trial is a civil trial, meaning this is not a criminal trial. I repeat, no one is being convicted or found to be guilty or innocent in this trial. And it's taking place in Virginia State Court because the servers and printing press for the Washington Post, which published the op-ed, are located in Virginia. Okay, great. Now that we're all caught up, I'm interested in discussing the role that the media plays within the courtroom and in the court of public opinion. Because as gross as this has felt to watch, there are also important arguments in favor of allowing media in the courtroom. And there is a balancing act that has to happen between the good of the litigants and public access to information. So there are three important things to think about when talking about media coverage and trials. Those are jury impartiality, the media presence within the courtroom and its effects on the proceedings, and First Amendment freedom of the press issues and how to balance that with the 14th Amendment's guarantee of due process. Keep those things in mind as I cover a brief but fascinating history of media and the courts that has shaped how we handle legal media frenzies today. Oh, we're going way back, my friends. Do you remember Aaron Burr? Remember him? Ever heard of Hamilton the Musical? Yeah, well, killing Alexander Hamilton in a duel was just the beginning of a lot of problems for old Aaron. In 1807, he was arrested and tried for treason on very little firm evidence and based on accusations from some of his contemporaries that he was planning to attempt to create an independent country in the southwestern United States and parts of Mexico. He was ultimately acquitted, but his already faltering political career was completely destroyed. People were burning effigies of his likeness in the streets all over the country. 
Newspaper coverage of his case had been extensive, with papers spreading stories of Burr's guilt, despite no firm evidence and despite his acquittal. Because of this drama, it was necessary for Chief Justice John Marshall to consider the importance of jury impartiality in light of media frenzies. He ruled that jurors should have open minds to testimony. However, if the juror has some knowledge of the case, that doesn't necessarily disqualify a person for serving on a jury. And then he cautioned against trusting jurors who claim they can give a fair verdict even though they hold strong opinions on the case. Okay, and that was the official guidance for over 100 years. But then this pesky thing called the camera was invented, and it started posing issues in courtrooms, especially in high-profile cases. State v. Houtman in 1935 prompted the American Bar Association to create official rules regarding cameras in the courtroom. You've probably heard of this case before. It's the Lindbergh baby case. On the night of March 1st, 1932, famous aviator Charles Lindbergh was at home with his family in rural New Jersey. His infant son Charlie was asleep in a second-floor nursery. An intruder used a homemade wooden ladder to climb up to the window and kidnap Charlie, leaving a ransom note asking for $50,000. When the news of the kidnapping broke, hundreds of reporters, photographers, and sightseers flooded the Lindbergh estate, likely trampling over potential evidence. The Lindberghs sent an intermediary to meet with a masked man in New York to give him the $50,000 ransom. All of the bills had been secretly marked and recorded so they could later be traced. However, the baby was never returned. A few weeks later, the baby's remains were found, badly decomposed in the woods not far from the Lindbergh home. An autopsy revealed the baby likely died not long after he was kidnapped. Two news photographers persuaded the medical examiner to allow them to take pictures of the remains, which were so grotesque that no newspaper would publish them, but prints were being sold for $5 a piece at speakeasies throughout the country. Two years later, the cops arrested Bruno Richard Hauptmann and charged him with the crime, having traced him after he used the ransom money at a gas station. He refused to confess, which led to what the press dubbed as the trial of the century, and media interference began before the trial even started. Hearst newspapers paid defendant Hauptmann's legal fees in exchange for exclusive rights to interview Hauptmann's wife during the trial. Weeks before the trial began, news organizations flooded the small New Jersey town to set up communications equipment, including over 100 telegraph wires installed in the attic of the courthouse. The first day of the trial was January 2nd, 1935. Tens of thousands of people clamored to get an entry ticket distributed by the county sheriff. The jury was chosen quickly and instructed not to read the news, listen to the radio, or talk to anyone about the trial. But then when they came and went from the courthouse and the hotel where they were sequestered, they had to pass through literal throngs of people, including newsboys yelling the latest headlines and people from the crowd yelling at them to send Houtman to the chair. And at night, the jury members could hear radio reporters broadcast news of the trial from a temporary station right below their rooms. During the trial, reporters were handing handwritten news copy to messenger boys to give to the telegraph operators in the attic. The judge had to repeatedly warn courtroom spectators not to laugh, giggle, or applaud. While Lindbergh testified, photographers took his picture with flash photography, and we're talking old-timey, bright flash type photography. Also, a film camera had been set up inside the courtroom by newsreel companies who produced video news for theaters throughout the country. And again, those things were not quiet or discreet in 1935. The newsreels had secretly also strung up microphones behind the jury box. Houtman was found guilty and given the death sentence. When the news broke, a crowd of 10,000 people outside the courthouse cheered and yelled, with Charles Lindbergh himself being very disgusted and calling it a lynching crowd. Houtman's appeal was unsuccessful, and in 1936, just one year later, he was put to death via electric chair. As a result of the Lindbergh baby case, photographers and cameras were banned in all federal and most state courts. And this rule held into the 1960s, when Texas ignored the bans and granted broad discretion to judges to determine whether to allow cameras in the courtroom or not. This led to two landmark Supreme Court cases, Estes v. Texas in 1965 and Shepard v. Maxwell in 1966. So Billy Sol Estes was a Texas businessman who committed massive fraud, including paying off government officials to look the other way. Because of his activities, JFK ordered the Justice Department and the FBI to open investigations into Estes's activities to determine if the Secretary of Agriculture had been compromised. Congress conducted hearings on Estes's business dealings, including some that tied him and his businesses to then Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson. Estes was charged with both state and federal fraud claims. During the course of the investigations into him, Estes had gained national notoriety, so there was a media frenzy as the trial was set to begin. 
At this point, Texas had granted judges with discretion to allow cameras in the courtroom, and the judge in this case did just that. Because of the attention the case was getting, Estes asked for a change of venue to move the proceedings to a different place where maybe there would be less of a frenzy. During the hearing to decide whether to change venue, everything was broadcast live on television and radio, and the number of reporters and their equipment were hugely disruptive to the proceedings. At least four of the jurors later selected during the trial had seen or heard all or part of these broadcasts. He was eventually convicted. Estes later appealed this conviction, saying that it violated his due process under the 14th Amendment, a refresher that the 14th Amendment prohibits states from depriving any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of the law. So here, they were depriving him of his liberty, so he was due a fair trial, which he argued he didn't get because of media interference and influence on jurors. And the Supreme Court found that he was denied a fair trial because of media interference, saying that they seriously influenced the public's, including the jurors, perception of Estes, and that the freedom of the press protected by the First Amendment has to be subject to the maintenance of absolute fairness in the judicial process. The First Amendment protection of freedom of the press doesn't extend to the right to use equipment in the courtroom that could jeopardize a fair trial. The First Amendment is satisfied if reporters are free to attend the proceedings and then report on them through their media. Estes would still spend time in prison on his federal charges, but this case set the precedent for balancing due process and First Amendment freedom of the press concerns. While that was all unfolding, another tragedy in middle America was taking place. On the 4th of July, 1954, Marilyn Shepard, a housewife in the suburbs of Cleveland, Ohio, who was expecting her second child, was bludgeoned to death in the early morning in the upstairs bedroom of the Lakeshore home she shared with her husband, Sam Shepard, a neurosurgeon. The murder was very gruesome, with blood splatters covering the bedroom and drops of blood found throughout the house. The husband, Sam Shepard, was immediately suspected of the crime. He maintained his innocence and said that he had fallen asleep on the couch watching TV the night before and was awoken in the early morning hours by the sound of his wife screaming. He went upstairs to find an intruder attacking her and he tried to fight off the intruder but was knocked unconscious. When he woke, he heard someone downstairs and saw the intruder leaving the home. Sam then chased the guy down to the beach where they fought and Sam was again knocked unconscious. When he awoke, the intruder was gone and he went inside and called his neighbors who came over, saw the body, and then called the police. Sam was taken to the hospital and immediately subjected to questioning without his lawyer present. He was asked to take a lie detector test, which he agreed to, but only if it was reliable. And the media grabbed hold of that story and immediately began posting headlines focused on Sam's refusal to cooperate with any questioning or lie detector tests. They published story after story questioning Sam's innocence. On July 21st, the front page of the local newspaper was headlined, Why No Inquest? Do it now, Dr. Gerber. Dr. Gerber was the coroner. And what did Dr. Gerber do that very same day? He called an inquest. He subpoenaed Sam and the inquest was held the next day. It was broadcast live and a swarm of reporters and photographers attended. Sam had attorneys present during the three-day inquest, but they weren't permitted to participate. The media continued to publish articles pointing to his guilt and spreading evidence that was never verified. They also focused on his extramarital affair with a woman named Susan Hayes and claimed that a number of other women were involved in affairs with him. Information that was again, never verified. Other headlines included, why isn't Sam Shepard in jail? And quit stalling, bring him in. The same night that that second headline was published, Sam was arrested for murder. He was denied counsel and immediately arraigned in front of hundreds of people and reporters, and the media frenzy only grew from there. The Supreme Court noted that there were five volumes filled with newspaper clippings, and they didn't even attempt to get excerpts from radio or television. The case went to trial two weeks before the November general election at which both the prosecutor and the judge were up for re-election. 75 potential jurors were called, and all three Cleveland area newspapers published the names and addresses of every single potential juror, and every one of them received letters and phone calls from people trying to discuss the case. When the trial began, a long temporary table was set up inside the bar behind the table for the attorneys. So you know in a typical courtroom, they have this long, usually wooden divider between the public and the parties and judge? Yeah, the media were given seats at the table inside that bar. Then there were four rows of seating behind the bar, which were all assigned to news reporters only, except for 28 seats in the very last row, which were assigned to the families, and the public could fill any vacancies in that row only if they received special passes. The news media also took up every other room in the courthouse, including the room directly adjacent to the jury deliberation room, where reporters were conducting broadcasts at the same time that the jurors were in the next room deliberating. All of the jurors and the judge, the witnesses, and the defendant were bombarded with reporters at every recess and had their pictures taken and published. So there was virtually no chance for juror anonymity. Anonymity. Juror anonymity. 
rural juror. And this continued for the entire nine week trial. Nine weeks with the courtroom continuously filled with clamoring news reporters that were so loud that despite the fact that there was a loudspeaker installed in the courtroom, it was difficult for the witnesses testifying and the attorneys to be heard above the noise. It was virtually impossible for the attorneys and the judge to conduct confidential sidebar discussions. So every time a sidebar was called, they had to move back to the judge's chambers. But then the rooms right outside the judge's chambers were also packed with reporters attempting to get information about what was just discussed. This continued throughout the entire trial. When defense counsel asked the judge to question the jury as to who had heard broadcasts about the trial, the judge refused saying, well, I don't know. We can't stop people listening to it. It's a matter of free speech and the court can't control everybody. We're not gonna harass the jury every morning. Those are his literal words. When the trial finished, the jury deliberated for five days and found Sam Shepard guilty of second degree murder for the killing of his wife and sentenced him to life in prison. He immediately appealed the decision, which eventually made it up to the Supreme Court, which held that Sam's due process had been violated because of the publicity surrounding his trial, saying that a carnival-like atmosphere had permeated the trial. And though freedom of discussion should be given the widest range compatible with the fair and orderly administration of justice, it must not be allowed to divert a trial from its purpose of adjudicating controversies according to legal procedures based on evidence received only in open court. Basically, the trial court failed to adequately put in place the protections necessary to guarantee Sam a fair trial, like creating stricter rules around reporters in the courtroom or better insulating the witnesses and jurors. The Supreme Court overturned Sam's conviction. A retrial was held in 1966, this time with a different judge and a stricter set of rules against media involvement, and Sam was found not guilty. Sam was released after 10 years in prison and went on to become a pro wrestler. He died in 1970 at the age of 46 from the effects of severe alcoholism. So these cases and subsequent Supreme Court rulings have helped to establish a general precedent that does not allow for the outright ban of media in the courtroom, but instead requires courts to carefully weigh First Amendment freedom of the press against the party's rights to due process and a fair trial. This is often achieved by clearly defining the rules of conduct for reporters during the course of a trial. Other remedies to try to preserve the fairness of the trial include changing the venue away from where the crime happened and presumably where the highest amount of media coverage occurred. Continuances, meaning a delay of the trial to try to lessen the heat of the publicity. No comment rules, barring attorneys from commenting about the case outside of court. Extensive questioning of potential jurors to exclude people who have been overly influenced by pre-trial media coverage. Requiring potential jurors to complete lengthy written questionnaires and extensive questioning prior to high profile cases. And questioning jurors during the trial to ensure ongoing protection against media biases and sequestering jurors in a hotel where they are forbidden to use phones or have access to uncensored media. Today, cameras and other recording equipment are generally barred in federal court, which is why you typically see court sketches for federal cases. In state court, however, many courts are given discretion to decide whether or not the media is allowed to record during the proceedings. Even where a judge allows cameras in, they provide strict rules that must be followed, as was the case with the Johnny Depp v. Amber Heard case. Remember that this is a state case, so the judge issued a specific order with rules for the media. Jurors are not allowed to be identified or televised. No cell phones or laptops are allowed in the courtroom. A limited number of live streaming cameras are allowed in. Behavior in the courtroom must be quiet and orderly. Next question. These rules are put in place by judges to avoid allowing the carnival-like atmosphere that could later lead to a reversal of the decision made in court. Now, you may have noticed that a theme of all these cases I just discussed throughout history, they were all criminal trials. The Depp v. Heard case is a civil trial, meaning no one is being tried for a crime, no one is being put in prison. It is a private matter between two private individuals that are asking the court to award monetary damages to one party or the other, depending on who the jury decides is liable. Generally speaking, we are much more concerned with ensuring that people who are being tried for crimes are being given due process before their life or liberty are being taken away. However, we are also more concerned too with allowing public access to criminal trials because the public should be able to observe how the state handles and enacts justice to ensure fairness and public scrutiny and transparency in the judicial system. We're less concerned with this when it's a private dispute involving money. However, the 14th Amendment, like I said, protects due process where life, liberty, and property are at stake. So it's still applicable here. And safeguards against the media interfering with the fairness of this trial and the party's constitutional rights are still applicable. Opponents of cameras and live broadcasts of trials are concerned with the effect of live televised trials on trial participants. Some witnesses fidget nervously when cameras are present, which is body language which could harm their credibility with jurors. Knowing that the world is watching can affect the behavior of 
everyone in the courtroom, from how the parties behave, to lawyers grandstanding for the cameras, knowing that a media frenzy can lead to a career-changing amount of publicity. News coverage is often skewed and one-sided, often assuming that one party is already guilty before a court has made any findings. News stories often include prejudicial information that wouldn't actually be allowed in as evidence in court. And studies have shown that potential jurors often have extremely negative attitudes towards the accused in criminal trials due to pretrial publicity, being more likely to believe the accused is guilty before the trial even begins, and being more likely to mistrust any evidence raised by the defense, which makes jurors more likely to hand down a guilty verdict in criminal trials. And this doesn't even touch on the role that social media plays in spreading information and misinformation that could bias potential jurors, though research on that topic is surprisingly lacking. Supporters of media coverage and cameras in courtrooms say that the public scrutiny requires judges, attorneys, and jurors to be on their best behavior, ensuring fairer trials, and that justice is better served when the public has unfettered access to information about trials. I think the answer lies somewhere in the middle, as the Supreme Court has already sussed out, because I am often very vocal about my frustration with how inaccessible supposedly public information about the courts can be. And I do believe that education and understanding of the way the legal system works is essential for creating an informed society and voting public. It's literally why I started this YouTube channel. However, when it becomes an obsessive media frenzy that causes chaos and creates strong public biases against a party in a way that has the potential to infect the jury pool or interfere with the running of court proceedings. Mr. Well, Depp, I, uh, with, with respect, the, uh, trying to respect the court's time and the jury's time, that was not my question. My question was I simply, when you, you would agree, you, look for you would agree, you would agree. That feels really wrong and gross. Based on the little footage I've seen of the Depp v. Heard case, it doesn't appear that the courtroom has become a circus, and the judge appears to have created rules to avoid chaos. But I can't imagine that the jurors are completely immune from biases, considering the extensive media coverage this couple has gotten over the six years since their divorce in 2016, and the extremely strong public biases that have formed. Nor do I believe that the participants in the trial, the lawyers, the parties, the witnesses, are immune from behavioral changes due to the high profile nature of the pressure of this trial, perhaps acting differently, more nervous, more defiant than they otherwise would. Whether this affects the outcome of the trial to the point that due process rights are being violated remains to be seen. What do you think? Please, for the love of God, don't ask me to dissect the details of the case I've already said. I am not interested in getting into it. There are at least 15 other lawyers on here already doing it, but I'd love to hear your take on the media and how extensively the public should be allowed to scrutinize our judicial process, even when the case creates such a media friendly that chaos is likely. Thank you once again to my partner on today's video, Warby Parker. Reminder that you can try five pairs of glasses at home for free by going to warbyparker.com slash Lija. If you liked this video, you may enjoy my video from last week where I talk about the history of DNA evidence and how it's used in criminal cases. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great day. Bye bye